In that, I, I hope that you're, I hope you're doing okay with it. <laughs> I hope you didn't come to some part and say, ah, that, that don't work for me. But just read on through it. Read on through it and stay with it. The reason we ask you to do that is because reading the Word of God teaches us the Word of God. Reading the Word of God teaches us the Word of God. And the Word of God becomes then a lamp to our feet, a light to our pathway. The Word of God becomes that place where we recognize the blessings that God has given us. And we, we're able to lay hold on them, bring them into ourself, because the Word says so. We learn that we can trust the Word, but we don't know that if we don't get in it. If we only hear it, if we only hear it from somebody else, that's how they see it. But when we get in it and God can speak to my spirit and to my need and my situation about it, and I see him do that, all of a sudden this word becomes alive for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So verse 15 Look at verse 23 and 24 of that same chapter, chapter 2. This is more advice, more instruction. Foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they gender strifes. Can I just tell you that you need to be really careful when you're uh, posting and reading and, and, and just taking in what's on Facebook or what's on social media? You really need to be careful because this verse right here is the warning that they didn't have it back then. But, but that's where this verse goes to. Be careful what you're taking in and avoid, even in the church. Oddly enough, there are people that'll find something to be contentious about and they'll come to you with a question. Got a question for you. I sometimes say to people, no, I don't answer questions. <laughs> you got to go ask Billy. He answers questions. <laughs> no, he don't either. He's shaking his head no. <laughs> you can tell by the eyes. You can tell by the, you know, by the, by the face. This question is going to be about some kind of thing that can't be answered. And it's always embroiled in some kind of trouble. It's always trouble going on and on and on. So those things he sells him to avoid. So there's some things we're to take hold of. Some things he's to, to lay hold on, to remember something. And then he says, don't do this. And watch what that next verse says. I want you to carefully look at that verse just quickly. The servant of the Lord, say that word with me, the servant of the Lord. Say it again, the servant of the Lord. Point at yourself and say, that's me. See, that's me. The servant of the Lord must not strive. Wow. How many find that hard to, you'd like to take a drink of water on that one. <laughs> must not strive. There are a lot of people, that, they like strife. They live in strife. They love it. A lot of people do. I don't think any of you do. But he said, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but what? Be gentle unto who? Say who? Everybody. Everybody. Now look around and say, man, I got to be gentle with those people. Think about somebody that gives you a hard time. Say, the scripture said I got to be gentle with them. I can't be rough with them. Yeah, I just can't do it. You know, I can't, can't go there. Apt to teach and be patient. So I'm watching a clock and I need to, I need to move on beyond this. But, but let, me, let me show you one more in verse 14 of chapter 3. And he, he does a lot of instruction in this. But I just picked these out because this is... Stuff that we all have to do. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So how many of you have been in this church as attenders here more than a year? 
Wow. I'd take that all the way up to 50 years, but I might embarrass somebody. But uh, most of us have been in here more than a year. So what this is saying, you learned, if, you, if you've been here over a year and maybe, maybe you've been here 10 years or uh, maybe this has been a lifestyle, maybe you're a second, third generation here. But what this is saying is the things that you have learned in this place or where you worship or with the people you worship with or with those that you follow, the things that you learn from them from the word of God, what he's saying is, continue in that. I'll just, I'll just give you a little bit of heritage just to show you this example. My grandfather on my mother's side was a, uh, he was a Pentecostal preacher. And he was a preacher that traveled in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. He was a, an evangelist at first. And after he married my grandmother, they settled down, began to have family. Then they became, became pastors. And uh, they were extremely strict, extremely strict. Uh, he would, for instance, condemn me for the length of my hair that I'm wearing today. By the way, I need a haircut really bad. In case some of you have been wondering, my hairdresser's been sick and, and I just didn't go to somebody else. But anyway, he would, he, would, he would really, he would get after me about this. That's a shame. That's part of my heritage. I try not to practice that now, but, but uh, because anyway, I came through the 60s where a lot of people wore long hair, including yours truly. <laughs> but he preached, he preached this word just like I'm bringing it to you, verse by verse. And he was not an educated man, but he preached this word. He knew this word and he preached it. My grandmother was also a preacher and uh, she preached sometimes in the services and was a great preacher of the word of God. Neither one of them were trained at all in the scriptures except reading the scripture and understanding what that scripture was being translated by God himself into them to deliver to someone else. That's part of my heritage that I grew up in. This verse is saying to me, continue in that. Don't get away from that dependence on the word of God. Don't move from that. They were both prayer warriors. Lived in, I lived sometimes after, I, after my mother died. My mother died when I was 11 years old, and I spent some time with my grandmother and my grandfather <clears throat> living with them. I lived with several people, but I lived with them for a while. And lived out in uh, rural Mississippi. And if you've been watching the weather lately, you know that tornadoes go through those places often. And uh, my grandmother would be able to read the skies, her and, and my grandfather, read the sky and know this is a dangerous time. Maybe there'll be a tornado somewhere near. So she would go, you wouldn't, she'd just disappear. And you'd go and find her beside her bed praying until that weather system was gone. And I've seen her pray a tornado. Lord, Put it in that open field. And that tornado come by that place and go across in that open field, cross the road into another open field, and then up through a wooded place. Now, not all of them do that. But I seen her one day, and I said, Grandmother, why did that happen? She said, that's what I asked the Lord to do. Amen. Send it somewhere else. Continue in that. Asking God to do the unusual for you. Continue in that. Asking God to be a God bigger than a tornado. Are you, are you listening to me? Are you hearing me? Asking God to be a bigger God than that, than that heart attack. Asking God, be bigger than what's in my life right now. Be bigger than that. We don't have to move the mountain. God don't need to move Mount Katahdin for us. He don't need to move a mountain. He can just bring us through it 
or around it because he's big enough. But we have to see him that way. And when you learn that, how many has ever learned that in your life? Let me see your hand if you've ever learned God's bigger than bigger these things. You see, when you've learned that, what Paul is saying to Timothy, the things that you know continue in that. This church would be vibrantly on fire if we all continued in what we know about God. And let me just prophetically say that this way, that it's coming back to that. We are moving back into what we know about God. And when we get back to a place where we are continuing in the things that we know about him, walking in that daily and not not veering off that, not letting things stop us, not letting things overcome us. When we get there, God is going to is bringing revival in this place. That's going to spill out all over this region. Amen. Amen. I, have a, I have a prophetic word about that, but I'll keep it for a while. I'll keep it for a while. You see, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love, sound mind. So the practical application of this is, I want you to listen to this. We have to be a powerful influence on the people that we're praying for. I told you this last Sunday. We have to be involved with purpose, with people you want to see revived and restored and renewed and saved. We have to be a spirit-filled, powerful influence with people that we work with and for. We got to allow the Holy Spirit to make us influencers in our world. Some of us are not. And that's, that's just because that's our natural, our natural way or our natural demeanor is. We're, not, we're just not people that influence other people. But the Holy Spirit gets into you and all of a sudden you are an influencer of other people. Not because of you, but because of him who abides in you. Him who abides in you. You see, we can have this revival and renewal, and we can have this. this. This is what God is bringing. It's what God has ordained for us. And here's what that early church experienced. And they were common people just like us. Their power <clears throat> from Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2, their power was the Holy Spirit operating from the inside out. And you can, you can go and read, and I'd, I'd go ahead and advise you to do this. Go ahead and read those first few chapters, up, right up to chapter 10 of the book of Acts, those first 10 chapters. And you will see that people that were before Pentecost, there were people like Peter that couldn't hardly put a sentence together without having his foot in his mouth. He suffered from, <laughs> anyway, he suffered from that. But then when the Holy Spirit is on him, all of a sudden, all he does is stand up to explain, and the scripture is clear with this, he stands up to explain to the people what they're hearing and what they're seeing. And it's, it's a powerful thing. He's trying to give them instruction about what this is, and in giving them instruction about that, 3,000 of them decide to follow Jesus. In a little three, take you maybe three minutes if you were speaking what he said. And how many would like to see that? How many would like to spend three minutes speaking to see three people saved? Uh, yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Well, see, the difference is what he was, what he was doing was unctioned by the power in him flowing out. It's not, not his prowess. It's just what was in him. So there was that power from the inside out. Their strength, that church, their strength was a united, as a united church or a united group with a single purpose. Just hear what the scripture says just in bits and pieces. The scripture says, 
These all continued with one accord in prayer. Acts chapter 2. They were all with one accord in one place. Acts chapter 2 verse 4. They were all filled. Chapter 2 verse 14. Uh, Peter stood up with the eleven. They were together. And they continued in chapter 2 verse 42. They continued steadfastly together in the apostles' doctrine. Verse 44. They were all that believed were together and had all things common. And verse 46, they continued daily with one accord in the temple. And in verse 46 again, with singleness of heart, they worshiped and they praised and they adored. So what they were doing, well, they were all on the same page. They were on the same page with each other. They were on the same page with the kingdom of God. They were on the same page with the Holy Spirit. And miracles and signs and wonders just begin to flow out of who they were. Not what they were doing. They had no official plan of evangelism without anybody that was no head of the Department of Evangelism, no committee. This group was a group that came together and the Holy Spirit directed everything about them. My, one of my goals in this place is to have it so that the Holy Spirit directs everything that we do in this place together. What we do in here, what we do out there, what we say, who we are, what we look like, that it's all directed by the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody else that wants to see that in this place? Yes. Amen. 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 That group was commissioned as followers of Jesus. And they, they simply believed what he said. I, I just marked that in your mind. Out of the book of Acts, you read, they simply believed what he said. He said, wait, they waited. He said, receive, they received. He said, go, they went. Just as simple as that. They didn't know where they were supposed to go. Just go. And he opened the doors. They literally took him at his word, and waited until that promise arrived. Listen, when we begin as a church to literally take God at his word, I mean literally take him for everything he says, we are in revival full-blown when we get there. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Amen, Pastor. I'll get over here. Uh, amen, Pastor. <laughs> I noted in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, and I, I'm going to close with this. Noted in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, ye shall receive and ye shall be. Receiving meant becoming something. They were required, they were required to be bold. They were required to be aware. Be bold, be aware. They were required to be always ready. They were required because the Holy Spirit possessed them, literally came in and filled them. They were required to be witnesses of Jesus. That means simply tell the story of Jesus. They were required to be aware of the guiding voice of the Holy Spirit, listening for that always. Several places where they're enjoined to hear what the Spirit says. Now, and they were also required to be willing to go where and when to whatever he sent them to. This, this mission developed for them because the prophecy was fulfilled. Joel 2.28 was fulfilled. And the promise that Jesus made was fulfilled. So the prophecy and the promise were fulfilled in them. How many, how many think that would be pretty thrilling? to know that both the prophecy from the Old Testament and the promise of the Messiah was fulfilled in their lives. That's pretty sweet, isn't it, Billy? 
I'd say that's pretty good stuff. I would say that's pretty sweet water to drink from right there. And I would say that it would make you a pretty strong individual in your faith. I say by looking at them that they became very strong witnesses of Jesus. Peter and John are going up to the temple, the hour of prayer. They're going to the temple. There's a lame man at the gate of the temple. And they haven't had a special prayer meeting for him. They haven't put it out on the prayer line. All they did was encounter him. I got to let that set with you for a minute. They didn't go back in the upper room and say, hey, guys, there's a guy down there that needs some help. We need to help him. What do you think we can do for him? All they did was meet him. And all he did was ask, can you help me? Can you help a poor man today? Can you give a few pennies? Peter is fresh out of that upper room. That Holy Spirit is so fresh in him and he wouldn't doubt this for the world. He says to him, we don't have any of that. He could have said, we've been up there for 10 days. So we don't have any money with us. But what we do have, and it was a chance encounter. I mean, they were going to prayer. They hadn't prayed yet. It was just a chance encounter. This is the kind of thing I'm telling you what Paul told Timothy to do. Those things, that, those instructions he gave him to do. If we'll take them to heart, and you can go back and look at them in 2 Timothy and read that little three-chapter book, three or four chapters. Read that, and you'll find every one of them. If we'll take them in us, and we'll really take hold of and practice, practice, practice who we are. When we meet people that need Jesus, we'll have the words for them. I know how this works. I, I know how this works. When we meet people that have other needs, God will give us the right way to bless them. We'll take them by the hand. We'll lift them up and say, what we have, we give you. Listen, how many know you've got the real Jesus living inside? Amen. What if you just took the one by the hand and said, it's all I got is Jesus, but I give you Jesus. What if we took the, our world around us by the hand and just said, it's all I got is Jesus, but I'm giving you Jesus. Do you think Jesus would be enough in your world? Let me see if you think Jesus would be enough in your world to make that difference. He does, don't he? And this closing word is where we come from to begin with. Therefore, being surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, why don't we lay aside the weights, the things that just take our coats off? Why don't we stop putting God in a little box? Why don't we let God just be God? Let Him love whoever He wants to. Lay aside every weight. And just let God out of the box. And let God get outside the lines if He wants to. I'm not talking about in your world. I'm talking about in my world. Just let God get outside the lines in my world. 
I'll tell you, revival comes to your world when you let God get outside of your restrictions, of your, I'm used to God this way. I'm, I'm comfortable with God. I'm, I like, well, no matter. Just let him out. And let him put strength in that crippled man's feet and ankles. And let the servant of God be able to lift him up. So when he stands up on his feet, he begins to jump and shout and leap and praise God wherever he goes. And he just upsets everybody's world. Peter, he went inside the temple and upset the worship service. People were watching him instead of watching the worship team. Imagine that. Upset the preacher because people were talking about that guy instead of this guy. What if that happened for us in our world? Wouldn't our world be different? Wouldn't this church be different? Therefore be encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Let us lay aside the weights and every sin that does so easily beset us. And let us, say that with me, us, Run with patience the race that is set before us. I want to win, don't you? I want to walk into God's kingdom. I want to come into his heaven with what Jesus said to his disciples. It is your Father's will that you bear much fruit and that your fruit remain. Can I tell you the kind of fruit that remains is not the kind that Reggie Adams convinces somebody of the truth of the Bible, but it's the kind of fruit that comes in because the Holy Spirit has taken the Word of God and has taken the, the very living Spirit that's in us and convinced them and caused them to turn their life to Christ. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Righteous God, hallelujah. Righteous holy God. Dera pokondo sitaka prahoti kum sit. Resti o mayanda hai, o ri, onkete ponti salabaite. Sheda hondeste la bayondo ke, la pokato pon rita, reta kombosia. Ye la mondo rabai yeste hundo cresti a hundo. Blessed, blessed, blessed Lord. Blessed Holy God. Holy God. Holy God. Holy, holy, holy God. Holy Lord Jesus. Oh, blessed God, blessed God, blessed God. Wonderful and marvelous are you, holy God. Righteous God, we just worship you. And we yield to your Holy Spirit. As you move across this body of people. Jesus. Holy, holy, holy God. Oh, Jesus. Yes. Yes, yes. I will restore what this world, this enemy of our soul has taken. For down deep inside of my heart remains that gift. I have not removed the gift that I have given you from here in this sanctuary this morning. So I say unto you this morning, stir that. 
Would you stand with me, please? Raise your hand toward heaven and just, I want you to just tell the Lord, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I want you to tell the Lord, I receive your word this morning. Lord God, I lead this congregation before you and we lift our hand toward you. And we say in so doing, we receive your word. The word that's been read in our hearing. The word that you have brought to us by revelation of the Holy Spirit. We receive today the promise that you have stirred the waters of this altar. We receive that word. That you are here to restore the gift that has been dormant. All you're asking us to do is stir it. And you're restoring it. We receive that powerful name of Jesus Christ we open this altar now Lord in the name of the Father Son and the Holy Spirit for all those that want to come in this place be restored and renewed and refreshed and to find the grace to stir the gift that is in them would you come would you come would you come Come to this place.